September 1944, Nazi Germany faces defeat. The Führer blames the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, under the command of World War I fighter ace Hermann Goering. The once proud Luftwaffe is running short of pilots and fuel. In the air, the Allies have total superiority. With Goering in disgrace, Hitler's protege and Minister for Armaments, Albert Speer, seizes the initiative. He orders the German aircraft industry to produce a new fighter to destroy the marauding Allied bombers. This new plane must be simple to build using slave labor and simple to fly by newly trained pilots. It is to be mass produced like the Volkswagen car in thousands per month. With every remaining able-bodied adult male needed in the army on the Eastern Front, the new plane is to be flown by teenage boys of the Hitler Youth. These pilots will be trained hurriedly on gliders. Because the sands of time are running out for Nazi Germany, Speer declares the new fighter must be designed, built and put into production in the space of only 90 days. The new fighter will be called the Volksjager, or People's Fighter. Professor Willy Messerschmidt, designer of the legendary 109 fighter of Battle of Britain fame, refuses to participate, saying it is impossible to create an aircraft in such a short period. But there is a German aircraft designer willing to take up the challenge. He is Messerschmidt's arch rival, Ernst Heinkel. Ernst Heinkel was the grand old man of German aircraft. He'd been building aircraft since World War I. He had a unique way of selling these planes. He had a hunting lodge outside of Berlin, and he would get the Luftwaffe High Command and the Air Ministry personnel, and they'd shoot stag, and then they'd have a good uh, food and drink and uh, get drunk, and then he'd sell them the airplanes. Willy Messerschmitt, almost certainly a serious Nazi, different man, an intellectual scientist. He built his aircraft as scientific implements. A number of other companies took part in the Volksjäger competition. The big Junkers company produced a, a design which had essentially a jet engine in a pod with two wings stuck on. It would never have been stable in flight. It was a silly project. Then there was the Blumen Voss company who were shipbuilders. But over the years they'd begun to produce rather curious aircraft designs. They tried another all-wing jet pod device and that actually came quite close to winning. After the HE-178, Heinkel built the world's first jet fighter, the HE-280. It flies in 1941. But the Luftwaffe High Command do not see the new jet as urgent, and it is not put into production. Hitler's eyes are on a blitzkrieg attack on Russia. Propeller-driven fighters such as the Messerschmitt 109 will do for the planned short war in the east. Germany will waste a crucial two years before turning to jet fighters to counter Allied bombing. When later Hitler demands jet fighters to regain the initiative against Allied bombers, it is not Heinkel's project, but that of Willy Messerschmitt that is ordered into production, the shark-like ME-262. But difficulties in perfecting the revolutionary new jet engine delay the introduction of the 262 into combat till after Normandy. German fighter ace and head of all fighter forces is Adolf Galland. He is convinced that if only he can get enough 262s, he can destroy so many American B-17s, the Allies will call a stop to their bombing campaign. But production of the 262 is slow because it requires scarce metal and two revolutionary jet power plants which are difficult to build. Germany needs a fast jet powered by only one engine a plane constructed from wood and simple materials that are easy to come by, the Volksjager. The, the Volksjager was built uh, with wooden wings for simplicity and because they, they were short of materials, though it's got an aluminium body. You had therefore to glue the wings and the tail onto the rest of the aircraft and unfortunately the one bit of German technology that never seemed to work even by the end of the war was the glues and a whole series of aircraft including the 162 tended to fall apart because the glues weren't strong enough. 
the 162, or at least the first designs of the 162, do have structural problems. The tail is too short. The back end of the, the fuselage body is too short. Uh, and so that tended to create all sorts of gyrations in flight, which in the hands of a bad pilot could get out of control and the aircraft would, would come apart. However, I think it's wrong to condemn the aircraft out of hand. If you build an aircraft so that it's totally stable in flight, then you can't dogfight with it and kill all the fighters. The best fighters are unstable, and therefore what you need to add is a good pilot to make sure that you can use that instability to good effect. Galland opposes Speer's new jet fighter. He argues it cannot be built in time, and it can only be flown by experienced pilots, a commodity Germany is fast running out of. But he is not reckoned on Ernst Heinkel. Working round the clock, Sleeping beside their desks, Heinkel's team design and build the first Volksjager in only 74 days. The Volksjager was powered by a single BMW 003 jet engine positioned on the top of the aircraft. This unusual position meant that complicated and heavy ducting could be eliminated. It also meant engines could be changed quickly in the field. The body of the Volksjager was metal, but the simple wings were wooden and contained fuel tanks. Unusual for combat aircraft of the period, the HE-162 was fitted with an ejector seat for the pilot. Also rare then was the nose wheel undercarriage. The aircraft was armed with two large 20 mm cannons with 120 rounds per gun. One shell from these weapons could disintegrate a US B-24 Liberator bomber. The Volkswagen had a maximum speed of 562 miles per hour and was faster than the ME-262. Deep under the mountains of central Germany, Speer built a vast, secret underground factory complex. Buried under millions of tons of solid rock, it is safe from Allied bombing. Here will be built three Nazi wonder weapons, the V-1 cruise missile, the V-2 rocket, and the Volksjager. The first HE-162 was rolled out and flown for the first time on December 6, 1944, reaching a speed of 522 miles per hour at 20,000 feet altitude. On December 10th, it is displayed to the Luftwaffe High Command with Flight Captain Peter at the controls. Tragedy occurs. The wooden wing disintegrates and the plane crashes, killing Peter. The cause is the poor quality glue used to construct the wing. But Speer would allow nothing to stand in the way of mass producing the Volksjager. In March 1945, the first 80 aircraft were completed. By the end of April, 200 more were ready. In May, the month the war ended, 500 Volksjager would have rolled off the assembly lines. And 1,000 per month would have been built starting June 1945 only six months after the first flight. To fly these planes, training of Hitler Youth pilots began on gliders. To ease the transition to the Volksjager, Heinkel supplied a two-seater glider version, the Model S. Without its BMW turbojet, the Model S lacked the distinctive humpback appearance of the fighters. The undercarriage was fixed and not retractable. The idea behind the People's Fighter project was to train thousands of Hitler youth to fly these things. Now that was obviously a, a, a silly idea. It's a very complicated aircraft to fly. If you're an expert, as the final pilots were, it worked. Uh, but if you were, had no, very little experience on, on any kind of aircraft, never mind a fast jet fighter, you would have been dead. Strange enough, one unit of Hitler Youth did become operational with the 162 in the closing weeks of the war. Unfortunately, all the records have been lost, so we don't know how they actually fared in combat. Conversion training to the Combat 162 was handled at a flight school in Vienna, headed by Heinkel's technical director, Karl Frank. The first regular Luftwaffe Volksjager fighter group, JG-1, became operational at Leck in Germany in April 1945, with 100 aircraft organized in two wings. It was commanded by Oberst Herbert Eilfeld. The first operational mission was flown on April 26, 1945, only days before the end of the war. Because the pilots lacked experience with the new plane, Flight Lieutenant Reichberger was shot down but escaped uninjured. On May 4, 1945, the People's Fighter drew first blood. Lieutenant Rudolf Schmidt shot down a British Royal Air Force fighter. 
it would be the Volkswagen's only kill. World War II ended two days later. Well, it was tested by senior British pilots after the war, and they gave it a very good bill of health. They said it was a very stable gun platform. They said because it was small, it would have been very difficult to hit by Allied fighters. So all in all, if it had got into production in a big way and got into action in a big way, it might have caused a lot of damage. Indeed, the senior British jet pilot of the time said that it would have run rings around a British meteor. Would the Volkswagen have tipped the balance in Germany's favor if the war had gone on longer? Ernst Heinkel was already planning more advanced versions of the Volkswagen. If the war had lasted into 1946, these are the planes the Allies would have faced. For extra speed, a swept-wing version was already under construction. The tail was also modified into an elegant butterfly shape to improve performance. With a new, more powerful jet engine, this HE-162 would have been a match for 1950s U.S. jets like the F-86 Sabre. Another planned version of the Volkswagen was one fitted with two ramjets of the kind used by the V-1 cruise missile. When the V-1 was catapulted into the air at great speed, air was forced into the jet nozzle. This combined into an explosive mixture with low-grade gasoline suitable for a lawnmower. The result burned like a blowtorch. Fitted with two of these crude engines, this version of the HE-162 would have been a kind of manned V-1. It was planned as a last-ditch weapon if normal jet fuel ran out. Most exotic of all was this version of the Volkswagen, with forward-swept wings. Not till the 1980s would NASA fly such a plane. But it was not to be. On May 8, 1945, the Volkswagen's of JG-1 were captured by advancing British forces at their base at Lech. The combat days of the People's Fighter ended with the surrender of Nazi Germany. But we can now reveal that the HE-162 Volkswagen was still to play a major part in post-war aviation history. After World War II, the French leader General de Gaulle was anxious to rebuild the French Air Force. The key was to be the Volkswagen's engine the BMW 003. The designer of this jet engine was Dr. Hermann Ostrich. As the Nazi regime collapsed, Ostrich escaped into neutral Switzerland. There he set up a company to continue his work. To disguise its origins, the company was called a French name, Atelier Technique Aeronautique Rickenbach, or ATAR. In December 1945, General de Gaulle's government paid for Ostrich and ATAR to move to France with 120 colleagues from his old BMW team. Using BMW's Volkswagen jet engine technology, Ostrich quickly designed a more advanced engine. This was test run southeast of Paris in 1948. Versions of this engine were used to power early French fighters such as the Dassault Mystère and the twin engine Voiture. By an irony of history, France supplied these aircraft to Israel during the 1950s when American aircraft were embargoed, thus allowing the Israeli Air Force its victories over the Arabs. Ultimately, a development of Ostrich's Volkswagen engine powered the famous Dassault Mirage supersonic jet fighter. The Mirage would also employ another invention of the German wartime aviation industry, the Delta Wing developed by Walter Lippisch. Imagine what Adolf Hitler's Luftwaffe might have done with such a powerful engine in an HE-162 with forward-swept wings for speed. It was not to be. After the largest tank battle in history at Kursk in 1943, the Red Army rolls relentlessly toward the very border of Germany. The Luftwaffe uses the famous Ju-87 as a tank buster. But by 1944, the Stuka is obsolete, too slow to evade fighters of the Red Air Force. What is needed to stop the Russian tanks is a new Stuka, powered by the revolutionary new jet propulsion. The dive bomber was invented in America by Glenn Curtis, who built sturdy biplane dive bombers for the U.S. Navy. September 27, 1933, Buffalo, New York. Fate is about to play a strange hand. Visiting the Curtis plant at Buffalo is Germany's greatest living World War I fighter ace, Ernst Uday, now a senior figure in Hitler's new Luftwaffe. 
Glenn Curtis invites Uday to test flight a factory fresh Curtis Hawk dive bomber. Impressed, Uday cables Luftwaffe chief Erhard Milk to buy the Hawk. Two months later, Uday will fly the first German version in front of Goering. Equally impressed by the accuracy of the Hawk's bombing, Goering orders a German equivalent, the Junkers Ju 87 Stuka. One man who is not impressed is Luftwaffe General Walter Weber. Weber wants large, long-range bombers to attack Russia, not small tactical dive bombers restricted to supporting the army. But Weber is killed in a freak air crash in 1935. With Weber gone, Milk and Uday cancel Germany's equivalent of the B-17, the so-called Ural bomber. They think dive bombing using the Stuka will be more accurate. Alone of the great powers, Germany will lack a successful heavy bomber in any numbers during World War II. Well, in the initial period of the air war, it was very effective because the Germans had complete uh, uh, air superiority and the uh, JO-87s could be used uh, for uh, frontline purposes, the purposes for which they designed. Uh, that is true, but that didn't last for very long because as the Russians gradually recovered their, their, their capability, and that is in 1942, then aircraft like the Ju-87 had, had a difficult time. On the other hand, the Germans, I think, were very adept because they basically altered the role of the Ju-87 uh, and began to realize it could be used not, as I say, just in a, a tactical dive bombing or forward uh, air support role, but could be used for something else, of which a very good example, of course, is Rudel's uh, use of the Ju-87s in a tank-busting role. Poland, September 1939, and the German Blitzkrieg rolls over Poland. Earlier and better days for the Luftwaffe. Success lies in using the amazing Ju-87 dive bomber, the infamous Stuka, as flying artillery to clear a path for the advancing panzers. The Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber was the most famous German aircraft of World War II. Over 5,700 were built, but its slow cruising speed of only 174 miles per hour made it prey to Allied fighters as World War II progressed something faster was needed. In 1943, the German Air Ministry instructed the Henschel Company to begin work on a jet replacement for the Stuka, the Henschel HS-132. The HS-132 had a planned maximum speed of 485 miles per hour and a range of nearly 700 miles. It could carry a 1,000-pound bomb. Later versions would have carried four quick-firing cannons for tank busting. The unique feature of the HS-132 was that the pilot did not sit in a conventional cockpit. Instead, the pilot lay prone on his stomach with his head at the front of the Perspex canopy. This position allowed the pilot to withstand 10 to 12 times the force of gravity before blacking out, instead of the 5 to 6 Gs if he were sitting. The primary target for the HS-132 was the main Soviet battle tank, the T-34. A late model T-34 had armor plate nearly three inches thick. Had the HS-132 been ready in time and in sufficient numbers, it might have held back the tide of Russian tanks on the Eastern Front. Especially in the hands of legendary Nazi tank buster Hans Rudel, flying the old Ju-87, Rudel single-handedly destroyed 519 Russian tanks. The greatest Stuka pilot of all time was a man called Hans Rudel who destroyed over 500 Russian tanks on the Eastern Front, uh, as well as a large Russian battleship. Rudel was a fanatical uh, devotee of Hitler. Uh, he fought to very and indeed survived World War II. And in the closing uh, days, Hitler wanted him to take over command of all the German jet forces. And had there developed uh, a version of uh, Stuka powered by jets, then those would have been under the command of Rudel. And that would have been a very effective combination. In the dying hours of the Third Reich, Hitler proposed to put Rudel in charge of all Germany's jet fighters and bombers. But it was too late. Fortunately for the Russians, their tanks captured the HS-132 factory before the three completed prototypes had been flight tested. Their subsequent fate is still unknown. 
The Russians were very fortunate, and it was a fortunate accident that their area of occupation in Germany took in 80% of the German aircraft industries, Heinkel, Messerschmitt, Junkers, they acquired a Rado aircraft, they acquired a large range of aircraft, but crucially they acquired two things, which was the BMW 003A engine and the Jumo 004A jet engines. What happened was that basically the German jet industry German aircraft designers, technicians, and the aircraft were moved back to the Soviet Union. And it's from that point, I think, that one can really say the, um, the period of, of, of German-directed uh, and German equipment entered into the Soviet um, uh, aircraft industry. If World War II had lasted into 1946, then the early German jets commanded by Hans Rudel would have had to face Allied jets, the British Meteor, and American Lockheed's Shooting Star. Realizing this, Hitler knew he needed a faster second-generation superjet to kill these Allied fighters. The result was Germany's last jet. In 1943, before D-Day, the high command of the Luftwaffe began to fear that America might use its new super bomber, the Boeing B-29 in Europe. The B-29 could fly at well over 30,000 feet, too high for the engines of the ME-262 jet fighter to work efficiently. There was worse news for Nazi Germany. America was already building the consolidated B-32 Dominator, designed to attack Europe at high altitude direct from bases in the continental USA. To counter these threats, the Nazi Air Ministry commissioned a new jet engine to power a fast, high-altitude fighter. This engine was the Heinkel HES-011. But there was a problem in building super-fast jets. Fast World War II piston-engined fighters such as the Mustang often crashed in mysterious circumstances when they went into power dives. Unknown at the time, Air builds up in front of an aircraft's wings as it approaches the sound barrier, 760 miles per hour, jamming the controls. But Nazi scientists working secretly in the 1930s discovered that a swept wing delayed the buildup of the dangerous air pressure in front of the wing leading edge. The new engine coupled with swept wings could give Nazi Germany a weapon to counter the B-29 and the Dominator. It was called the Focke Wolf TA-183. The TA-183's designer was Dr. Kurt Tank. Tank was already famous for building the legendary Focke Wolf FW-190 fighter used against the Russians on the Eastern Front. Kurt Tank is a very shadowy figure, but he's one of the great German aircraft builders of World War II. A very serious Nazi indeed. He built the four-engine focke -Wolf Condor bombers that helped guide the German U-boats against the Atlantic convoys. He built the FW-190 fighter, and he always said of that that he was building a workhorse, by which he meant it could be repaired in the field and kept going, and indeed did during the, uh, the Eastern campaign. And he compared that to Willy Messerschmitt's ME-109, which he said was just a thoroughbred racehorse. He didn't think very much of it. Tank's design was chosen in March 1945. It was called the TA for Tank 183. Its nickname was Hunchback. A single-engined machine, its planned speed was 593 miles per hour. The secret of the Hunchback's performance would be the revolutionary swept wings. Its combat altitude was to be 45,000 feet, spectacular for its time. But Tank faced another problem. The first generation of German fighters, the Messerschmitt ME-262, flew too fast for accurate shooting with a conventional cannon. Yet to slow it down, it risked being shot down by Allied Mustang and Thunderbolt escort fighters. Jet fighters needed a new offensive armament. The air-to-air -air guided missile. But these were already being developed by Hitler's scientists. The Germans were developing a whole range of technologies, defensive technologies by the end of World War II, including air-to-air -air missiles.
The Allies only started developing air-to-air -air missiles seriously at the time of the Korean War, which so you're talking a 10-year lead the Germans had. They had wire-guided missiles which paid out a long wire back to the launch fighter aircraft and the pilot of the fighter aircraft could send signals to navigate the missile directly onto its target. Another technology they used was uh, infrared. Uh, they had a system of uh, using a light from the bombers to trigger uh, guns on, and, and missiles on the attacking fighters. Um, their most successful air-to-air -air missiles were actually the simplest, which were just firing masses of unguided missiles uh, in a, a big arc and hoping a bomber got caught. Had they deployed those uh, early enough, then they could have killed the B-17s and the B-24s. The Rorschach X-4 missile. Development began in 1943. The X-4 was guided to its target using a wire control link to the mother aircraft. Early versions had a speed of over 700 miles per hour. The first X-4 was successfully launched from a Focke Wolf FW-190 on August 11, 1944. It would be the weapon of choice for the new TA-183 jet. If the war had lasted into 1946, things would have been very different. Armed with deadly X-4 air-to-air missiles, the fast TA-183s could have downed high-flying U.S. bombers, including B-32 Dominators, carrying atom bombs on strikes from U.S. bases. But the TA-183 was ordered into production in March 1945, only two months before the collapse of Nazi Germany. It never flew. At least, not then. Kurt Tank and Germany's leading fighter pilot, Adolf Galland, took a whole series of German aircraft engineers and Luftwaffe officers to Argentina and essentially recreated the Luftwaffe there. Kurt Tank set up an aircraft industry to build jet planes and Galland set up a jet fighter force for the Argentine Air Force. This is what would have faced and destroyed Allied B-29s in 1946. The TA-183 built in Argentina after the war for General Perón. It was rechristened the Polqui, Spanish for arrow. Some even think that the legendary Soviet MiG-15 was based on captured blueprints of the TA-183. I think the... the priority from the Russian point of view was to make absolutely sure that they had a knowledge and experience with jet propulsion. The second thing was to get it into aircraft, their aircraft, make them work and above, have a, above all have a semblance, as I say, of, of combat aviation capability. So what the, if, if you look at the um, early Russian jet aircraft, the MiGs and the Sukhois, they're simply copies of German aircraft. Air mobility and vertical takeoff are now primary tools for military operations. But in the dying days of the Third Reich, as Allied bombers made Luftwaffe airfields unusable, the Germans had already turned to VTOL technology as a way to beat the bombing. The Germans had developed a whole range of operational helicopters by the end of World War II and indeed had a, a, an operational unit flying on the Eastern Front, rescuing pilots and picking up crashed aircraft. Their big plan, which would have made, a, made the, the helicopter's name in World War II, was to rescue Mussolini, flying in a helicopter, dropping the troops down, picking Mussolini up and getting him away. Unfortunately, the helicopter available to use on that mission crashed on a, on a, on a rescue flight the day before, which is why they had to go in with paratroops. Berlin, 1938. Flown by Germany's ace woman test pilot, Hanna Reich, the Nazi regime startles the world with a demonstration of the world's first practical helicopter, the Fokker FA-61. It is a demonstration with a difference. It takes place inside the Great Berlin Exhibition Stadium. The FA-61 was the brainchild of Heinrich Fokker, founder of the Fokker Wolf Company. During World War II, Fokker would build a large military helicopter known as the Kite. They were used by the Luftwaffe to rescue crashed air crew and aircraft in the east. Mass production of the Kite was prevented by Allied bombing of the factories where it was being built. German industry desperately needed fighter protection. In September 1944, Fokker Wolf began work on an answer. 
The Faka Wolf Tribeflugel, or Thrust Wing, a VTOL fighter powered by three ramjets mounted on the ends of three rotating wings. The ramjet engine spun the wings like helicopter blades, giving the Tribeflugel lift. The planned rate of climb was 25,000 feet per minute. The Tribeflugel carried a pilot in a conventional cockpit. The intended speed was 621 miles per hour. Armament would have been four cannons. But the war was to end before the complicated Tribeflugel could be built, though its ramjet engines were successfully tested at speeds up to Mach 0.9. But the Tribeflugel idea was sound. In the 1950s, the U.S. Navy experimented with a similar vertical takeoff fighter, the Convair XFY-1 Pogo. Several successful flights were made by the Pogo, which had a speed of 575 miles per hour, very similar to that planned for the German aircraft. The Pogo was abandoned when tests revealed a major problem. The aircraft was extremely difficult to land because in pre-computer days, even an experienced test pilot found it difficult to tell where the ground was. In wartime conditions, with airfields under Allied attack, landing the Fokker Wolf tribe flugel safely would have been virtually impossible for the average military pilot. But Fokker Wolf were not done with the vertical takeoff fighters. This is the Fokker Wolf FW-1262 fighter bomber built in West Germany in the late 1960s as part of a NATO competition. The early 1980s. Engineers of the Northrop Corporation pay a secret visit to the National Air and Space Museum's Silver Hill facility in Maryland. They go to examine the sole remaining example of another secret German aircraft captured at the end of World War II. But unlike the Tribeflugel, this aircraft actually flew. Hidden in the Smithsonian's Garber facility is a piece of technology forgotten for 40 years. A revolutionary flying wing and the first plane ever built with stealth, radar invisible characteristics. Late February 1945, midnight for the Third Reich. Hitler's revenge weapons, the V-1 cruise missile and von Braun's V-2 ballistic missile have failed to destroy Allied morale. Desperate to revive his own reputation with Hitler, Hermann Goering calls a secret meeting on his personal estate at Karen Hall, 10 miles north of Berlin. To this meeting are summoned the brothers Reimar and Walter Horton, two young Luftwaffe officers. The Horton brothers have designed a series of revolutionary all-wing aircraft, a design that by eliminating a normal aircraft's heavy fuselage makes a plane lighter, faster and longer ranged. The concept is successfully tested on a series of unpowered gliders. They fly beautifully. The Horton brothers then work on a jet fighter version, the HO-229. It successfully flies in late December 1944. It is flown by test pilot Ervin Ziller. The HO-9 was powered by two Yumo-004 engines, similar to those of the ME-262. It had a maximum speed of 607 miles per hour at an altitude of 39,000 feet, faster than many post-war jets. It was armed with four cannons and could carry two 2,000-pound bombs. But there was an unexpected result from this new futuristic shape. With no tail and buried jet engines, the HO-229 bounces back few radar waves. Stealth technology has been born. Only when the prototype flies and has a weak radar signature do the Horton brothers realize what they have stumbled on. The Horton has other possibilities. Goering realizes that the low-weight flying wing is the only technology left to Germany to build a bomber with a range to attack America and so force a truce in the West even at this late hour in the war. The kind of long-range bomber Germany has lacked since Uday fatally cancelled the Ural bomber ten years earlier. Nazi plans to attack New York using ordinary bombers have failed because the technology to refuel them in flight is too primitive. But a larger version of the HO-229 flying wing will be able to carry fuel long enough to fly to New York and back. Goering now gambles everything on developing such an aircraft. The Horton 18 America bomber. 
Its huge wings would carry fuel to fly nearly 7,000 miles at an altitude of 52,000 feet. It will be powered by four new Heinkel Hearth HES-011 jet engines and carry a crew of three. Maximum speed would be 528 miles per hour. Gehring plans to build the HO-18 in the huge underground factories already in existence to manufacture the ME-262 jet fighter. These factories still exist as they were too huge to destroy after the war. But what kind of bomb will the America bomber carry? By 1945, dropping a few small high explosive bombs on New York or Washington will have little effect on the U.S. war effort. How close was Germany to delivering an atomic bomb? The man in charge of the Nazi nuclear bomb program was Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg could have made an atomic bomb, but he and Albert Speer, the Nazi armaments minister, thought the war would be won before the weapon could be perfected, so resources were never committed on the scale of the Manhattan Project. What if the Volkswagen and Focke-Wulf TA-183 had held off U.S. bombing long enough into 1945 for the huge new underground factories and synthetic oil plants to come into production? Imagine. It is just after dawn on the morning of April 20th, 1946, the Fuhrer's birthday. A Horton HO-18 jet bomber, a KG-200, the Luftwaffe's best bomber wing takes off on the most important mission of World War II. It is piloted by the Luftwaffe's best bomber pilot, KG-200's commander Werner Baumbach. Baumbach has long advocated airstrikes against the Panama Canal and New York using one-way flights by conventional bombers whose pilots would bail out and be rescued by U-boats. He spent a lot of the war trying to persuade Goering to bomb New York. And one of the interesting stories about the German war effort is why they never did. Bamberg's first idea was to take Focke Wolf condors and fly one way to New York and Washington, bomb America, and then ditch the aircraft uh, uh, south, probably in the Caribbean, and be picked up by U-boats. Goering took the plan to Dernitz, but Goering and Dernitz hated one another, and they fell out, and so the plan came to nothing. Uh, so Bamberg then went on trying to find ways of bombing New York, and it's interesting to speculate that if something like the Horton Wing had been available, it would have given them for the first time a machine to get there and get back non-stop. Today, Bombach's target is 3,000 miles away. The world's largest city, New York. In 1942, President Roosevelt put New York's mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, in charge of America's civil defense against German bombing attacks. LaGuardia organized machine guns placed on top of high buildings in New York. But Bombach's bomber is flying at an altitude nearly 10 miles high and is invisible to American radar. No one hears or sees it as it passes over Manhattan at 8 a.m. local time. The morning rush hour has begun. Fortunately for New York, World War II ended while the Horton 18 was still under design. The successful HO-229 jet fighter was brought to the United States in 1945, but its revolutionary potential was not realized. It lay forgotten for 40 years in the Smithsonian. Or almost forgotten. In the early 1980s, engineers from the Northrop Corporation pay a visit to the HO-229 at the National Air and Space Museum's Garber facility in Maryland. They are secretly building a stealth bomber for the U.S. Air Force. After their visit to the HO-229 prototype, Northrop engineers will design the B-2 Spirit. A design eerily similar to the Horton brothers' dream of 40 years earlier. Hitler's aircraft and rocket designers were men of genius. They pioneered ideas that are still being rediscovered and built. 
Fortunately, their genius did not arrive in time to alter the outcome of World War II.